He's made us thirsty for He is the well that we keep seeking We can't be satisfied By any other kind He never leaves His children empty Cause the well never runs dry
any of you happy? If you are, you should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. You are forgiven. Our God is faithful, and he is always there with us, even when the waves seem to crash upon us. Call upon the Spirit to guide and comfort you. The Spirit can lead you to walk upon the waters and take you to new places in your life. We are called, called to live our lives in prayer. God is with us. Without borders, let me walk. 
Hi, I'm Lori, and you're watching The Wave. Today's Globe Offering supports Sun Wow, serving our neighbors weekend of worship. Did you know that people of all ages have come together this weekend to serve our friends and neighbors right here in Harbor Country? Homes have been painted, yard work completed, and most importantly, we are building relationships as we serve our neighbors. Today's Globe Offering helps support the cost of this vital ministry. Blessings in a Backpack will soon begin its sixth school year of providing food to the children of New Buffalo Elementary School who might not have enough to eat on the weekends. In preparation for the new school year, we will be holding a food drive at Barney's Market on Friday, August 5th from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. and Saturday, August 6th from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Join the enthusiastic volunteers who greet shoppers and accept donations of food and cash in two-hour time slots. If you are available to help at the food drive at Barney's Market with a two-hour time slot, please contact Mary Robertson. Your help in preparation for the upcoming school year is greatly appreciated. Water's Edge is gathering for a farewell luncheon celebration in the Commons and Patio on Sunday, July 31st at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Join us as we recognize and thank Worship Arts Director Andrew Stang and vocalist Sarah Hercula and wish them well as they relocate in Bala, Missouri. Bring your favorite Andrew or Sarah story for great fellowship and fun. A box is in the Commons for your cards or letters to Andrew and any gift that you wish to include. Don't forget to join us online for worship when you cannot attend in person. Our live stream is broadcast at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time every Sunday. Download our app on your Roku streaming device or catch us on Facebook or go to the website at h2oedge.org slash live stream. See you in worship. Okay, so let's recap what you need to know. Support today's globe offering for Sun Wow. Sign up with Mary Robertson to volunteer for this year's Blessings in a Backpack Food Drive. Come next Sunday at 12 p.m. for a farewell luncheon to say goodbye to Worship Arts Director Andrew Stang. And join us on our live stream whenever you cannot be here in person. There are so many opportunities to become involved here at Water's Edge. Find out more about becoming involved by checking out our website at h2oedge.org or on Facebook. And may God take you to the edge. <laughs> Good morning. Join with me in prayer. Sovereign God, be with us this morning as we again meditate upon your word and the direction and scope of this magnificent sacred history that we are enfolded into. Guide our meditations, guide our hearts so that we reflect the joy and the grace of Christ in our meditations and in our actions. Amen. It was a world-class drought. I mean, the worst of the worst. For three years, there had been nary a drop from the sky. First the creeks and the streams dried up, then some of the rivers. Then the lakes and the reservoirs started getting dangerously low. The ancient people of Israel were in a real fix, and they knew it. They had a king, a fellow by the name of, of Ahab. But as kings go, he wasn't terribly interested in the people. He was actually more concerned with trying to find the last bare places where there was some grass that his cattle and, and his horses could feed upon. They had a queen, too. Her name was Jezebel. She had been the daughter of a foreign king, and when she had arrived to marry Ahab, she brought with her her fancy foreign gods. Now the people of Israel were not only worshiping their historic god, whom they called Yahweh, we just use the generic God these days. But alongside of that, they also had all of these gods that Jezebel and the priests that she had brought with her. And so it was quite a mix. Let's face it, these new gods were pretty flashy. I mean, they did fire and they had elaborate ceremonies and 
Yahweh, Israel's historic God, was pretty much just a spiritual presence, and the temple was of Yahweh was simple and unadorned, and so Yahweh seemed pretty pedestrian in comparison. I can only imagine, I can only imagine what the divine perspective on all of this must have been. There's God thinking, I have created all that is, including these people, and now they've got these guys alongside of me. Yahweh God thinking, I set up covenants, boundaries in our relationship so that, so that my people would have some, some sovereignty and make some choices in their life. And now they have these guys alongside of me? Implicitly, I gave them dominion over much. Yahweh God even promised the day was coming when they would be led and guided by a spirit to do what is best. And what happens? These upstart nobody gods, and let's face it, that's what a false idol really is. A nobody, a nothing. These upstart nobody gods show up and people break their promises and start running to the show. In short, they lacked faith. It's because of this that Yahweh God taps a fellow by the name of Elijah on the shoulder. Elijah is a prophet. And he has him go to Ahab the king and announce that for three and a half years it's not going to rain until Elijah says so. And notice this fact. It's not God who says so. It's Elijah who says so. I mean, here's the direct quote from 1 Kings 17.1. As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I, that's Elijah, give the word. That's some, that's some power. With God's guidance after proclaiming this, Elijah heads off to a place where he can hole up for the next three years plus. And finally, after that time, Elijah, with God's guidance, heads back to Ahab. And Ahab sees him from afar coming to visit him. And he's going to pronounce now that the rains are going to start again. But Ahab is a little frustrated with Elijah. So even before he arrives, he starts shouting the names at him. Yep, the name calling. Names him Troublemaker and a few other things. Which seems to get Elijah's nose out of joint. And one thing leads to another, and they go back and forth a little bit. And before too long, they decide we've got to settle who's the real authority in Israel once and for all, and they choose to have a contest. And the contest is really quite simple. On one side, there's these new gods of Jezebel and the 450 priests of these gods and Ahab standing with his wife. And on the other side, there is Elijah and Yahweh. The contest was simple. They would put a pile of wood together and they would lay a sacrificial offering upon it. And the one who could call upon their god and have God bring down the lightning and ignite the offering, that would be the winner. So they start out early in the morning on the slopes of Mount Carmel. And Elijah lets the 450 priests of of Jezebel's chief god, a, a fellow by the name of Baal, go first. And they start in. They are shouting to their God. They start dancing until their foot sore. They are screaming until they're hoarse. They're even doing some cutting of themselves with knives, hoping that some blood flowing would get their God moving. And they do it all, but nothing works. I mean, nothing works. <laughs> and there, this is where it gets kind of, well, kind of fun. 
Elijah's not a good sport about this. I mean, the terrible sportsmanship starts right here. He starts trash talking. I mean, really trash talking with these guys. When you go home, if you, if you want to hear it and see it for yourself, you can read the 18th chapter of 1 Kings. It's right in there, the trash talking and everything else. And if you do that, and I hope you will, take some time to read the 19th chapter as well. I'm not preaching on that today, but it is as beautiful a description of humility as you will ever see. So anyways, Elijah starts with the trash talking. Maybe Baal's flown off to Vail for a ski weekend, he shouts. Well, not Vail, you know, not a ski weekend, but you get the idea. He says he's on vacation. Maybe he's taking a nap. Which really just gets these 450 priests of Baal just almost crazed. And they just go all in trying to call up their God to ignite the sacrifice to no avail. Finally, At noon, Elijah steps up. One of my favorite authors, a guy by the name of Frederick Buechner, describes this moment this way. He says, Elijah is like a magician getting ready to pull a rabbit out of his hat. I mean, Elijah approaches the moment with real panache. He has them get what precious water they have and just pour it all over the offering to get the wood and everything really soaking wet. And then he has them dig a trench around the, the sacrificial altar there, and they fill that with water so, so they can see it's going to be really wet around there. And just for good effort, he has them pour more water on it until the place is just, just doused. Then Elijah draws close. <laughs> He draws close, and he calls upon the name of Yahweh God, and boom! There's a sizzling sound, and you can smell the ozone in the air, and the lightning comes down, and whoosh! I mean, the offering just goes up in flames. What was the difference? What was the difference... Between, you know, Jezebel and Ahab and the priests of Baal and, you know, at least to a certain degree, the people of Israel who kind of fell in love with these new gods. What was the difference between their way that didn't work and Elijah's way that did? Elijah had faith. That's all. But faith makes all the difference. The Bible tells us that Elijah was a man who, quote, walked with the Lord, unquote. Which is really just a very poetic way of saying that Elijah was someone in tune with the divine presence. Now these days we would say something along the lines of filled with the Holy Spirit. Last week, I mentioned that God is here as a guide and a lead for us. For Elijah, God was being that guide and lead. Last week, I mentioned that there was, at least to a degree, a shared sovereignty with God, and that God is using that shared sovereignty in order to build this this new great reign of Christ out of the chaos that was, and is operating, at least in part, through us, fallible human beings. Oh, to be sure. Absolutely sure. God still, I mean, got the lion's share of the power. As operating as a guide and a lead, as God was a, a guide and a lead to Elijah. But look what happens here. Look at the kind of thing we can tap into when we are in line with the divine presence. Look at Elijah. I mean, mean, whoa. And it doesn't end with just one lightning bolt. Elijah goes, as the story concludes, up to the top of Mount Carmel. And he prays for rain. Remember chapter 17, verse 1? We read it a little while ago. He prays for rain. God now responds. 
After making the prayer, he sends a seven over, servant over to the edge of the mountain, and, and he says, take a look out toward the sea, you know, toward the west, see what's going on. And after a few trips, the servant finally comes back, and he says, I see a cloud far on the horizon. It, you know, it's about the size of a fist. There's a small cloud, and it's coming this way. One little cloud. That's all Elijah needs because he has faith. So he tells the servant, scoot on down the mountain where Ahab and you know, all the losing side are. Tell Ahab that he better get in his chariot and head home because the rain is coming and it is going to be a real gully washer. And if he doesn't get out of here now, you know, he's going to be having to pull the chariot over to the side of the road and put the flashers on. It's going to be raining that hard. And look what happens next from 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, verse 45. As soon as the, as soon, and soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm while Ahab left quickly for home. Being engaged with the divine presence, being filled with the Holy Spirit, to use our language in the in the era after Jesus' first coming, creates a capacity for faith and lends to us a power of remarkable nature to really transform human endeavor. One of the persons who picks up on this fact is an early Christ follower who writes the letter in the New Testament called James. And he concerns himself with this sort of power. He focuses not only what we say as Christians, but also on what we do and where the power to do that comes from. In the fifth chapter of the letter, James is, is writing to other Christ followers, and he's saying that, that God has enabled them through faith to do great things, especially in prayer. Let's look at verses 13 through 18 in the fifth chapter. Are you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was a human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. James reaches back and he recalls the story of Elijah. And he uses it to teach the early Christ followers a very powerful lesson about faith. Pray in faith. Sing praises in faith. Anoint in faith. And God responds. Last week, you know, I pointed out this great arc as I have each week of, of the sacred history we're living through and how God has lent a measure of sovereignty over creation to human guide and that God's Holy Spirit is here now to lead and guide us. James, is, James takes us one step further. James reaches back to Elijah to point out not only is God here to lead and guide, but that God is also responsive to our actions. Do, do you hear the nuance of this? Look, if I'm, now 
If I'm out in some remote corner of the wilderness, blazing a trail where no one else has ever been, I'm going to hire a guide. I'm going to put that guide, whoever he or she is, out in front of me, and I'm going to follow the way they lead because they're a professional guide. But if someone is responding to my words or actions, then I'm in the lead. And they're following. Look again at a slice of the text from James. Are you sick, he asks? You should call upon the elders of the church. And they'll pray over you and they'll anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. And then he goes on to say, such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. God responds to prayers for healing, just as God responded to Elijah's prayer for rain. The implication of this is profound. God will respond to our actions. Prayers, praises, anointings, our actions. What does this say about the nature of God and God's relationship with a person of mature faith? Well, let me ask you. How would you characterize a relationship where sometimes one partner in the relationship leads and the other follows, and other times that first partner follows and the second partner leads? How do you characterize such a relationship? I would say such a relationship is based on mutuality. Is that how we typically see our relationship with the divine? No, come on. No. Not by a long shot do we see it that way. We like to keep God, you know, up here. I mean, way up there. And us, we like being way down here. We like keeping God at arm's length. Now, there's a worship series coming down the road when we're, where we're going to talk about why we want to keep God distant. But for now, for this series about sovereignty, let's just learn this. We prefer distance to intimacy. We prefer authority to mutuality. And all of that's fine, except for one little thing. It doesn't jibe with the things Jesus taught us. Which I guess isn't really a very little thing. Jesus called God Abba. Which we like to translate as Father. We like that distance. But the direct translation is Dad. Jesus said, you know, if two or three of you get together, you're not alone. God is there. Jesus said, God is, he's like that old woman who loses a coin and sweeps the house till she finds it because she really wants that coin. Jesus says, God is like that shepherd who, who has 100 sheep and he's got 99 safe and sound in the pen, but that one is missing and it just doesn't feel right, and so that shepherd goes searching. Jesus said, God is like a father, a dad, who sees his wayward son who has been living a lost life off in the distance and who's walking now home down and dejected. And what does dad do? He runs out the front door and meets the kid with a hug. Mutuality. The God Jesus describes is not an authority figure on a power trip. Yahweh God, as described by Jesus, longs for relationship. A mutual relationship with you. Elijah prays. God responds and the rains fall. James says, Somebody sick? Have the elders show up. Have them pray. Have them anoint with oil. And God responds. The Lord will make you well. 
God is saying, bringing this creation from the chaos that it was to this beautiful reign of Christ that it's going to be, well, sometimes I'll lead and guide with the Holy Spirit and you follow, and sometimes you take action and I'll respond. We're in this together. Us and God. Act in faith. And I'll respond, says your, says your God. And so this morning, I want us to simply pray. A very simple, straightforward prayer. Let's pray we can have the faith to do our part. Let us pray. So here's the thing, God. We know each other very well. And you know about me, and Lord, in transparency I pray this morning because I think I'm not alone. You know that sometimes I walk into a relationship with you and there's this great mutuality and this giving back and forth, but for every moment I spend like that, Lord, you know there are a lot more where I, I want the distance and the mutuality just isn't there. Lord, if, uh, if such times have been a part of my life, I pray this morning and... And we all pray this morning, Lord, that you help us to step up in faith. Faith in you, faith in ourselves, faith in this relationship. So that in the give and take and the working together one with another, beautiful moments can happen. Things like Sun Wow, where neighbors were served and, and, and needs were met. Beautiful things like times of prayer, when, when the laying on of hands can pull forth your spirit. Beautiful things like songs of praises that just bring you right into the heart of worship. If I have, or if we have, Lord, been less than we could have been, then in these quiet moments, help us to confess and in confessing, help us to feel your presence, feel that relationship all over again. And Lord, in thanksgiving, we pray for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit so that we might feel that grace and walk by your strength. And now in the quiet places of our heart, O oh Lord, we acknowledge the, the brokenness of the world we live in. Oh, we hear the promise of faith that First you and now you and us together are building something that this great kingdom of God, this, this kingdom of heaven, this reign of Christ is, is heading toward us. But Lord, sometimes it's hard to see. And so this morning, God, we just pray for the broken places. Maybe there's a person in our lives or a neighbor who's injured of body and soul, weakened with sickness. And God, we just, we raise our hands and pray for your spirit to pour into their lives for healing. We pray as well, oh God. We pray deeply and profoundly for healing of the human spirit and heart. You know the shattered relationships 
You know the sins that we struggle with in our individual lives. You know the places of dark, dark shatteredness that we don't even want to name or touch. And we raise our hands again, O oh God, and pray for your spirit to enter into such places with a healing, profound presence. And Lord our God, you know the brokenness isn't just in us as individuals or small relationships, but that it, it goes across communities and across nations and across all your creation. And Lord our God, we raise our hands again and pray for a fresh outpouring of your spirit upon our communities and upon our nations and upon your creation for the healing of that which is and for the establishment of that which you are building us toward. And so pour out your Holy Spirit upon all who are gathered here until we lead lives of mutuality with you through your spirit and with one another because your spirit is in our midst. Until we lead lives that reflect the life of Jesus, the perfecter and the pioneer of our faith. Help us to lead lives that that reflect the things he taught, that live into the actions he took, and that are powered by the prayers and the ways that he prayed them, fully in your presence, in absolute faith, that the things he prayed for would become a part of your kingdom. And we pray together now for these things in his great kingdom prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing. as you leave this place today. I'm going to be selfish for a moment. Make sure to come next Sunday for that is our last time in worship together with me and Sarah. Remember, there's a little party afterwards at noon. And may God take you to the edge this week. Amen. Amen.